Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. I get to introduce myself. So I'd like to talk about Arisat 1. And I've got quite a few pictures here. So the, I'm going to be going through this fairly quickly. How many have had a chance? How many know about Arisat 1? Great. And how many have a chance to listen to it? Great. Fantastic. So this is a little bit about our journey in, in creating Arisat. So I had the pleasure of working with the Aris Group and AMSAT and Tapper had some involvement with this project as well. I think many of you know that Aris is an international organization made up of the member countries of the International Space Station, the United States, Russia, Canada, Europe, and Japan. And it's all staffed by volunteers. And SUITSAT-1, which was launched back in February of 2006, was nothing short of phenomenon. Um, it operated quite well. It didn't operate as, it, as we wanted it to. In other words, we wanted to be able to have the downlink strong enough to where anyone with a handheld could be able to listen to it. Didn't quite make that accomplishment, but those that had you know, good antennas, good beams, they were able to listen to SuitSat, and I think the, the best blog is, is AJ3U's blog here. Everybody submitted their recordings and their, um, <clears throat> listening, their, their reports on SuitSat, and he basically chrono did the whole chronology. Go to that website, start at the bottom, and work your way up to the top. And SuitSat lasted for two weeks. It operated on batteries. There was no solar panels on it. So we knew that it was going to have a limited lifetime on the batteries. We didn't know exactly how long, but we know now that it was about two weeks. Now, we wanted to work on SuitSat 2, and we wanted to make improvements. Namely, we wanted to be able to add the solar panels to it. We wanted it to operate longer. And we also wanted to be able to put the ability for people to create experiments and c connect those up, and then you get the experiments telemetry transmitted down. We wanted to put cameras on it, and we wanted to put a linear transponder to allow you to talk through the satellite. So we had a suit, and we were going down the path of designing another suit set, thus we called it suit set two. Well, here's, a, here's part of the crew. And one of the things that over the almost four years of working on SuitSat 2, which became Arisat 1, over 50 people have, been, have worked on this. So this is one of the work sessions that we had at my place of employment, which is Microchip Technology in Chandler, Arizona. Everybody would fly in on a Friday. We would spend the whole Friday afternoon, evening. We'd take one of the large conference rooms and we would rearrange all of the tables, and we'd make one great big workroom. And we would work all day, or half day Friday, all day Saturday, and half day Sunday, and then everybody would fly back. And we did this several times. It was an opportunity for everybody to get together, collaborate, and then make out the work assignments, and then people went back to their residence, and people flew in from all over. Now, the Dayton Hamvention of May of 2009, this was the demonstration at the time, and it was basically saying we we're going to do a lot of the similar things that we did with SuitSat 1. Of course, this is a motorcycle helmet, but we wanted to give it the illusion that we were going to have the control panel on the helmet, much like we did SuitSat 1. And then we were demonstrating the new electronics that were going to go inside the suit itself. Well, around July 2009, when the occupancy of the International Space Station went from, I believe, two to six, 
they needed more room in the International Space Station and the suit that was to be ours for suit set two had to be discarded. In other words, make room. So there's one thing that we learned is there's not much space in space. <laughs> so we lost the suit and we had to regroup and there became basically the birth of Arasat and got Arasat 1 and now Arasat is now a space frame. Here's a block diagram of the electronics internal housekeeping unit talking to the software defined transponder through the codec this goes to a 10.7 IF to the RF module of course then this is hooked up to the antennas here the IHU controls the SDX but it also controls the power supply unit through the max PowerPoint transfer or max PowerPoint um, trackers the solar panels are connected up here a battery video digitizer onto four cameras and then these are the experiments down here. So the space frame took shape and the shape of it was kind of dictated by mostly by the solar panels. We'll see a picture here in a moment that with solar panels that go on the four sides and the top and the bottom these are solar panels that were given to us by NASA. These are space rated solar panels and they measured about 19 inches by about 5 inches. So the satellite itself ends up being about 21 by 21 by 11. And the overall weight when it was done was a little over 50 pounds. So this is what it looks like when you make a spacecraft out of paper. <laughs> and you kind of get an idea because what we were trying to do was all of the electronics, everything that we had accomplished up until this point, we didn't want to redesign it. We wanted to use it as is. So the space frame, so what you see here is a mock-up of each of the boxes that was intended to go inside the suit or on top of the helmet and we were trying to find ways we were going to bolt it inside the frame. And we wanted to make this as simple and easy and as quick as possible. So here's Lou McFadden working on one of the first frames that was machined and this is very much like what was in, in the end. And of course you can see big open space here but this is the base, the skeleton. Notice the handles on the outside here because this satellite is not being launched on the top of a rocket. It's actually going to be sent up on a progress to the International Space Station and on an extravehicular activity, otherwise known as a spacewalk, the cosmonauts will go out basically handling it. And so we needed to give them a good way to be able to hold on to the satellite with their gloved hands in a spacesuit. So this may look like it's really big, but when you get a chance to look at the video, you can see that that was pretty much the right size. So here's how it filled out. You can see the frame. You can, the main electronics box is right here, the internal housekeeping unit. So majority of the electronics in this box. The RF right next to it. The max PowerPoint trackers, which will communicate to all six of the solar panels here. A larger box here, which is the battery. The battery is actually given to us by Russia. It's the same battery that goes into the backpack of the Orlon suit. And this is a 28 volt silver zinc battery. It's the same type of battery we used in suit set one, but we're given this one battery because basically we knew we were getting the suit and with the discarded suit we would get the used battery. So that would go here. Control panel, this was originally meant for the helmet. One, this is the two meter antenna, which is on the top. The 70 centimeter antenna is on the bottom. And then this is the Kursk State University of Russia's experiment, which they wanted to measure atmospheric pressure. And they wanted to be able to see what happens when Arisat gets closer and closer to the, to the Earth and to the re-entering into the atmosphere. So here's, here it is all colored in. This is what it looks like. There's the camera with a mirror. So this will shoot off in this direction. There's another camera which goes straight up. 
and another pair of cameras basically opposite shooting down and to the left of this picture. But you can see the experiment, the control panel, two meter antenna, and then three of the solar panels. And of course, you can see the handles. Here's what it looks like from a cutaway view. When we work on satellites, we do not call this an exploded view. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad karma, you know. We just... So this is a, a cutaway view. And again, as I mentioned, here's the, the uh, what we call the IHU. This is the majority of the electronics, MPPTs, RF, battery here, cameras, the other cameras. And as you can see, there's a lot of space inside it. You know, there's a lot of air. Actually, that air got sucked out, but anyway. But I mean, there's a lot of room on the inside. And when people get to see the, the, um, the demo version of this that we take around to shows, we had it at Dayton. People look on the inside. Instead of solar panels, we have Lexan covers, and you can look inside. Everybody's like, oh, there's a lot of room inside there. And it's because we reused all of these boxes. These were the very same boxes we intended for inside the suit. So inside that IHU box is this, what we affectionately call the stack. On the bottom board here is what we call the interconnect board. The next one up is the power supply board, this one right here. The next one up is the IHU board, and the top one is the software defined transponder or SDX board. So individually, now what they would do is mount on the lid of the box, this connector here is to the battery, and this little board here is what we call the DTMF decoder board because one of the requirements is that you have a separate frequency and a code sequence that you can shut down the satellite. And this is basically the DTMF decoder. It hooks up to the receiver. I have a picture of that in a moment, and I'll show you that it hooks up too. And here it is getting basically wired up, each of the connectors. This is getting close to being, this is the black unit. When it, whenever you see a picture of the blue units, this blue here, this is non-flight. But when you see the pictures of the the black here, these are the flight units. So this is getting laced up here. Um, you see the lacing here, and then this will get its coating. This is getting ready for flight. This is a top view of the software-defined transponder. Um, the microcontroller running it is actually on the bottom, but here's the SMA connectors for the in and out. This is the codec right here. This is the internal housekeeping unit. Here you can see um, this is the PIC32 microcontroller, this is a CPLD, this is a RAM, and this is a four-channel video processor chip that took the NTSC video from the four cameras. We digitized it and stored it in the RAM, and then the PIC32 addressed the picture out of the RAM and then applied the tones to it that made the slow scan television. So that's how we did that. This is a top view of the power supply unit. You'll notice that there's the different channels here. There's six here. These are basically the serial lines that go to each of the max power point trackers, and each one of those goes to the individual solar panels. The idea is that we were making each of the solar panels smart, and then the PSU here actually has two microcontrollers, one here and one here, that addresses each one of them, and we keep track of the voltage coming off of each of the panels we, and the voltage on the battery, and we also keep track of the uh, current. And each of these are actually switching regulators. We take the 28-volt bus and we create 12 volts for the cameras, 8 volts for the RF and 5 volts for everything else. And that 5 volts generally gets regulated down to 3.3 for the majority of the electronics. This is uh, the RF. And this particular part of it, this is the transmitter here. And then there's a receiver board that goes on top of that. And the idea we were trying to go for with SuitSat is that the software transponder would be inside the torso of the suit, and we had to run a lengthy coax from it, basically out through the arm. We remove the glove, then the coax comes back up the arm, and then we had the antenna on the helmet. And we wanted the RF, so the transmitter would be the two, two meter downlink, 
145.95, of course, is the FM side of that. So then we would have the F two meter transmitter and the 440 receiver here and then go back and forth 107. So that's what this is. This is basically the RF, the business end, and then the coaxes that you see here go off to the antenna or they get routed down to the SDX at 107. Here, this red board is the command receiver. So this is the four, it's on the 440 and it takes the uplink so that we have our DTMF cones. We can actually reset it or we can shut it down or put it into a low power mode from this. Now one of the things is we have, I don't think we've gotten to testing this at this point, maybe later. Here's a, one of the panels, basically as I mentioned, donated by NASA from a, uh, the SMEX project. You can kind of get an idea with, there's, a, there's our hand model, um, taking a picture there, for those of you that watch Seinfeld. Here's the back of it getting wired up. Um, what you're seeing here in the, this is the connection, this goes to the max PowerPoint tracker, these go to the individual cells, and then right here in this epoxy are thermal sensors. So when you look at the telemetry that's coming down and it, tell, and it reports what the temperature of the solar panel is, well that temperature was taken right here. Here it is being hooked up to the space frame. We used a very sophisticated hook and latch system, otherwise known by the trademark name of Velcro, <laughs> to hold the panels in. And then there's Lexan covers that go on the outside that are used for shipping. You can kind of get an idea as you see it going together. Um, it was nice to make these legs to hold it up where you can work on it. Here's the, um, the control panel, the Kursk experiment, the top here. So it's going together. This is the Lexan covers, and they're using these uh, T-pins to hold them in. They can be removed uh, at the end of the line. Here's a picture of the top of it. This is a um, solar panel simulator. It is a power supply and it basically rotates through because we know that as the satellite is up there tumbling, there's no attitude control to it, that each of the panels gets light and of course the other ones either get a partial light or no light at all. So we needed to be able to simulate this on the ground to make sure that our max PowerPoint trackers are working and our PSU is able to keep the bus at the appropriate voltage. And then of course there's always use old soul, so we took a couple of the panels out. And what's interesting about this, <laughs> this picture is that then the satellites inside the garage actually working from these solar panels. So test, test, and more test. This is the max power point tracker. What you see here is there's actually three and they're just routed together. So this particular box, there's two boxes, each one of three. And this, each of the solar panels is, is routed out to it. And then each one of these goes to the PSU and then the power goes out on the bus. And the idea of each of these MPPTs is to keep, keep the voltage on the bus um, at the appropriate voltage, which is 35 volts. Now, if we go back here, this is a heat sink. One of the things we had to pay attention to is, okay, take a look at these components. Quick, tell me which ones emit heat. And it turns out it's actually these inductors here because it's a switcher of sorts. So we had to create um, a heat sink so each of those inductors, so this has been machined custom, so each of the inductors is going to go into each of these wells and then bolt onto the the edge. What's interesting in doing thermal in vacuum is you don't, you can't use fans. It, uh, <laughs> I, I have not read a paper where anybody's tried it, but I've been hi highly reassured that fans don't work. <laughs> the Russians put air inside a satellite and put fans in it, and it worked. Okay. The air had to keep the air in, which is tough. So what? That was in the early days of okay, so what Rick is saying, 
is that they actually fill the satellite with air, but as you know, if you've got a good vacuum on the outside, you'd have to seal that up. But that's clever. We should try that sometime. You know, amateurs can, can do some pretty clever things. So the idea is to spread the heat. So all, if you remember back to your high school physics, so heat can be conducted or convection or by radiation. So the, con the, um, the convection goes away. You don't have the heat. I'm sorry, you don't have the air to be able to do the convection. So you've got conduction and radiation. So the idea of these heat sinks then are is to radiate the heat and spread it, get it out to all of the metal. So not only is this heat sink, but that heat sink then bolts onto the sides here and spreads that heat to the rest of this die cast box. So you want to, your, your goal in space is to get all of this heat to spread itself out as evenly. You don't want point sources generating. So when you, let's see, I don't know if I have a picture of this all but Yeah, I do, great. So here's the two MPPTs. Basically, you'll see all the RTV here. This is all dressed up for flight. Here's the heat sink, and then each one of these is a temperature sensor. All right, I think this is really clever. They took one of the little eyes, you know, like the crimps. You put the wire in, you do the crimp. Well, they put the thermistor inside there, put thermal epoxy inside of it, and created these little sensors. So when you look at the telemetry and it's saying MPPT temperature, here they are. This is the actual temperature. Here's Lou and, and Gould. This is um, out in the sun in Arizona. We were in the, uh, one of the in interior courtyards there at, at work. and. Um, Notice we went down to Harbor Freight, okay, Harbor Freight is the ham's friend, <laughs> and put together, the, this is four-sided, we had the MPPT, so now as you guessed it, this thing has a ball bearing at the bottom, so the idea is we were going to rotate it and be able to see that the trackers followed it. So you get to do some pretty clever things that you want to put together these mock-ups so that you can test out that it's actually going to work in space. So you're trying to recreate what's going to be happening in space. So here's a picture at the top. So here's three of the MPPTs. You can see here, this is a much earlier version where they were separate. And then we decided in a later version that we would put all three on one printed circuit board. Here's the battery. So this is an actual photograph sent to us by Russia. So this is the actual battery that goes inside the Orlon spacesuit. Here's the connector for it. And this is made out of silver zinc. So if you've not had a chance to read up about silver zinc, it's a very interesting chemistry. It has probably the highest density of all battery chemistries. Much the reason. Now, this is the one and only sole battery that's inside the spacesuit. And as you can imagine, as it's put together and constructed, it's a very high reliability battery. Now, as the story progresses with the operation of suits or of Aeroset, many of you know that this battery has failed and it's failed open. This particular battery is only designed for five charges and then they discard it. So one of the things that we struggled with is we didn't quite know how to treat this chemistry from a satellite charge point of view. So the decision was made to do a shallow charge and hopefully extend the length, the life of the battery. Well, as we know today, this battery only lasted eight days. Now thankfully, or actually you could say luckily, it failed open instead of failed short. If it failed short, it'd bring down the bus, and then the satellite would be rendered silent. But it failed open. So when you look at the telemetry, and of course what happens is when the satellite's in the sun, it powers up and it operates fine. And you can read, when you look at the telemetry and you see the voltage and it says battery voltage, that's actually no battery but that's all of the voltage of all of the solar panels on that bus. And you'll see that it's a bit higher than the battery voltage itself. So that's the story behind the battery. So whatever we do for the next satellite, we've got to come up with a different battery strategy. 
Here's the cameras basically created into t assembly of, of two. And as you saw in the picture, and I believe I have another picture, here's the picture of it in the frame. One of them's going to go straight away, and the other one's going to go through a mirror. Here we go. Now, what's interesting about these mirrors is they're not perfectly 90 degrees. They're off a little bit. I have to go back through my emails to know the exact angle there, but take away from this is that it's not exactly 90 degrees. But we're getting some beautiful pictures coming off of the satellite, and I'll have the URL there to show you where the pictures are at. They're just phenomenal. So this is one of the first pictures taken on the workbench, and we were just ecstatic that it actually worked. Here's the control panel. Our goal here is to make it very simple for the cosmonauts. Take the satellite out the airlock, one, two, three switches. There's a timer. There's actually two timers, but the overall time is 15 to 16 minutes that the transmitter's disabled so there's no RF hazard to the cosmonaut. Allow them to throw the switches and basically get the satellite deployed. And that plays into the battery failing and every time it comes out of eclipse into the sun and then we get voltage on the battery, guess what? That safety timer kicks in. So as soon as it gets voltage, it takes about 15 to 16 minutes before it starts transmitting. Here's what that switch looks like on the back side. Each of the switches, it's just basically a, a a passive plane to get the switches through onto the cable, the cabling. Here's what the antennas look like. We, on the top, we have a two meter antenna. It's made out of very famous steel tape rule steel. Doesn't have the measurements on there, it's just the steel itself. It's interesting, AMSAT bought this roll of steel from one of the tape manufacturers and it's probably been the source of antennas for AMSAT for the past 25, 30 years. <laughs> uh, the antennas are then coated with a Kapton tape that help keep the corrosion down and also make it not as sharp on there. Now, there's going to be a story a little bit later on on the 70 centimeter uplink antenna here is we're going to see that we're going to, it is missing. So, in true AMSAT fashion, here we are in the garage. This is the AMSAT vacuum chamber. Basically stuff all the electronics in there and draw a vacuum on it. Also change the temperature, bring it down, make sure the electronics are going to work, and then read the telemetry off of it, make sure the telemetry jives with the temperature that we have it at. Here's the space frame coming together. As you see, everything's black. On the inside, this is a flat black paint. On the outside, it's coated in nickel, again, for thermal properties. And Dick Jansen is our uh, thermal guy, and this is all of the suggestions of how it's to, to be done. I'm, as I go through here, I'm showing you where the different temperature sensors are, and of course, when you look at the telemetry, you can see that the satellite's running pretty hot, anywhere from 50 to 60 to almost 70 degrees C, and we expected it to operate pretty much minus 20 to plus 40. So it's operating a little bit hotter than we expected. So we got to go back and say, why is that? And we have already asked, but we don't have an answer yet. The cabling here, Larry Brown, W7LB, did the cabling. This, this was a lot of work. So one of the things in designing the satellite, one you want to do is keep the cabling to a minimum. I mean, it's a source of failure, vibration, but it's just an overall pain. But uh, I'm sure Larry's fingers were basically calloused and bleeding by the time he had all of these built up. Here it is, all flight number one's all buttoned up, getting ready for the crates. But before we do that, we take it down and we put it on a great big shaker. And then we just vibrate the heck out of it and see how it works. And yes, this is Lou's expression all the time. <laughs> This is Lou's carry-all, so you can see the, the two satellites. This is the flight one with the solar panels. This is the backup. You can see the Lexan covers. So two units, two complete units were completed and shipped to Russia. 
taken them down to the crating company. They created the wooden crates, put it inside anesthetic, and there we go. I wish, uh, where's Bob McGuire, his favorite phrase, take me to your planet, Houston. So these are going basically to the shipping coming and heading all over to Russia. Russia then decide they repack it, they put this um, padded cover around it, and they're lowering it inside the progress capsule. Here's a picture looking down, and there's Arisat tucked in with all the other equipment inside the, the progress capsule. And then on January 28th, progress number 41 is launched and goes up to the International Space Station. And we had thoughts that it would be launched in February during a Russian EVA, but it, the actual SUITSAT deployment was put off. They still had the EVA, but they didn't do the suits, or I'm sorry, the AeroSat deployment. And of course, they did that just recently here in August. So we can see here the commander is posing with, with AeroSat, another one of the crew cosmonauts. Here it is bouncing around fluting, basically waiting. And we, for those of you that had an opportunity to listen to AeroSat while it was in the International Space Station, notice in this photograph here, see the antenna is removed and then it's connected to a coax and it's, it's connected to one of the two meter antennas that's on the outside of the space station. So we were able to operate AeroSat on the space station and that's where people got to do, get their signal reports for it. And then on August 3rd, during an EVA, it was deployed, and what a treat it was that they were, the cosmonauts were wearing helmet cams that day. And this video is on YouTube, and you can go back and watch it, but talk about bird's eye view of the satellite, whereas SuitSat-1, it was just a camera that was off one of the legs of the International Space Station, and we were kind of looking across. But here we are seeing it first person. So you can see here the top of it. Here's the control panel, the experiment, the two meter antenna, the top solar panel. And it was fun to watch how you know, their suited hands were be able to hold on to the handles. Now, as we were watching the video, I kept doing a visual inspection of the satellite. And, I, and there was just this brief glimpse and of course, you know, it just went by and I'm like, there's no antenna there. And, it, and it's not like I'm gonna run to the red phone <laughs> on my desk and call up Russia and say, hold it, hold it, you can't deploy, there's no antenna. So we're watching and I, I thought there was no antenna and sure enough, I kept watching and it's like, and they would just never turn it over. I was like, come on. So they finally, it came back around, I'm like, there is no antenna there. And a couple of minutes later, they even commented. So they kind of held off on it. So they went off and did the rest of their EVA work. And that lasted for about two, almost three hours. Then they came back and decided, OK, we're going to deploy it without the antenna. I don't think we'll ever know what happened to that antenna. But the bizarre thing is the satellite works. People are able to communicate through the transponder with one watt. So I think from now on, we should take our antennas and cut them off. <laughs> only the 440 ones. Yeah, only the 440 ones. I think uh, physics would not allow us to do that with a two meter one. But there's basically, we think there's about an inch and a half of the antenna inside this cover here that's sufficiently enough for the uplink. But we're talking about one watt with like an arrow antenna. You know, nothing inter so we'll better lucky than good. <laughs> so that was quite so if you want to operate it, here's basically the frequency plan. This is up on AMSAT and Arasat. I have some, again the last slide I have here has got all of the web links for you. Um, the easiest thing for you to do is to get your FM handheld with a rubber duck, go out when Arisat is overhead, dial up 145.95, and it, several of you raised your hands that you heard it, and yes, you will hear it on an HT with a rubber duck. So we are more than thrilled with the operation of this satellite. Of course, we'd like for the battery to be working. You need to make sure that when you listen to it, it's in sunlight. So 
If it's in dark, you can go ahead and go to bed. You don't have to, it, it's not going to be up and running in the dark. Um, so linear transponder, 70 centimeters up, 2 meters down, inverting. So lower sideband up, and it'll be upper sideband coming down. On the FM channel, you'll hear the voice announcements, the greetings from space. There's 15 languages. Count, collect them all. <laughs> Slow scan television, I'll have a slide here. Telemetry is spoken on the FM channel. CWID, there's two CW beacons. We use one to basically be a marker so you can tune the BPSK. Phil Karn wrote a very robust fading resistant 1000 baud BPSK. It's working very well. And the cool thing about the telemetry is uh, Douglas, can't pronounce his last name. Quigliano. Yeah, I'm glad you guys know how to say that. So he wrote this program, open sourced it, so you can listen to the BPSK. All you need is a sideband radio, which just about everybody owns one of those today. Pipe that into your sound card. And I don't have a picture of the tuning indicator, but use the CW Beacon 2, line it up, and then it starts doing the hex dump, and then it puts it actually in readable format. So there, here's the six solar panels. Here's the status. Here's the temperature. So this is kind of in a machine readable, or actually a human readable format. And to my absolute amazement, and to Douglas's credit, which I think is the most, one of the most phenomenal things about this satellite, is you can then click a button and say, submit this telemetry. And it goes to a central server. This is just as of September 14th. Over 100,000 frames of telemetry have been submitted in the past six plus weeks. This is phenomenal. This has not been done before in amateur satellites. Now, this does include dupes, but look at this. Over 35 countries have been listening and submitting this. This telemetry is then in comma separated value. It's up on the server. You can go and download it, put it into your favorite spreadsheet program, and have a blast. <laughs> You know, and your friends are like, what are you doing? I'm playing with telemetry. So have fun with telemetry because then you can see the entire life. You can see the battery voltage going down. You can see the battery. You can see the temperatures change. So it's just, I hope what we'll see long after Aerosat's probably stopped operating is more and more people examining and presenting papers on this telemetry. and basically gold mining data out of this telemetry. I hope a lot of eyes get on that. Now, if you don't have those, you can go online. This, there's a URL. I'll give this to you. And you can bring up this page. And it's whatever the last telemetry frame that was submitted. And you can read it up on the web page. Slow scan television, I don't even know how many thousands of pictures that have been submitted. I did a screen capture yesterday. Just absolutely gorgeous pictures. These are all done in Robot 36. It takes 36 seconds to transmit it. I think one of our missions of making Aerosat easy to operate has been met by the virtue that we have so many pictures that are being submitted, so many frames of the telemetry submitted. And I just marvel at this. I just go here every day and just marvel at the pictures that are on here. And also to my amazement, and I probably shouldn't be amazed, but today most of us that are they're a little gray in the beard is that there's all of these websites. If you go up to YouTube and just do a search of Aerosat, I did this yesterday for this presentation. There was over 270 YouTube submissions. And you can go and watch. Basically, people are record, video recording their, their passes. And the, a lot of these are instructional. For example, this one here is how to do slow scan. You can do it. This is instructional. So some are just, OK, here's my reception report. This is phenomenal. Another testament to the satellite, 
SuitSat 1 was a phenomenon because it was so unique in the electronics inside a suit. However, Arasat is probably one of the most operated satellites by virtue of all of these. And here's all of the URLs. Go to arasat1.org and then amsat.org. The telemetry is at aris. Just type in arasat and then a tlm for telemetry.org. And the slow scan, gallery, slow scan TV gallery is on the amsat.org. If you go to amsat, you'll find the link to the slow scan gallery. And I am out of time. So the quick question. All right, let John get you the... The slides from both your presentation and Scott's, uh, I noticed they're not in the... In what, we'll, what we'll do is, uh, at the end of the conference, we will create a DCC page on the Tapper website, and we will have all of them up there, okay? Mark? What's the, uh, uh, the satellite holding up as far as its work? Okay, so um, Mark's question is, how is the satellite doing with respect to its orbit? Of course, it's decaying. It's an incredibly low Earth orbit. When the cosmonaut deployed it, he, he pushed it down. Well, they had to because they don't want it coming back and being a, a hazard to the International Space Station. That would be bad. We wouldn't have a place to deploy satellites from. <laughs> So it, it, it was purposely set down, so we estimate around seven months or so. Now there is a chicken little contest. You can go to the AMSAT website and enter. I mean, hams are a real creative bunch, right? So I'm afraid I'm out of time because I want to hear Mike's talk. He's going to talk about his satellite project, but I will be in the demo room. I'll bring my computer, and we can talk to our heart's content all about AMS, our AirSet, okay?